Good evening, everyone. Glad to be here with you today. Can I get a show of hands how many people work for themselves and deal directly with clients? Great. Uh, ever do a sales conversation? Needs analysis? Project management? Everything? Well, tonight we're going to talk about creating great conversations around those things because, as we all know, when we have dealings with clients, it's very easy for things to go awry, isn't it? Anybody ever had that happen to them? No. <laughs> so it's important that you build real good relationships with your clients. So first, let's talk about what can go wrong with a project. I've got a few ideas up here. Sometimes the project team never really gels, and things arise in terms of conflict. People aren't sure what to do. Working with each other is different. A lot of times team members feel like their input isn't heard and it doesn't really matter. Sometimes feedback gets kind of nitpicky. Uh, if there are perfectionists in the group, oftentimes they are you know, really looking for perfection rather than progress on projects and that can help derail. So when we work with different types of people on different types of projects, it's important to really get a lay of the land when you work with people. And unfortunately, most times, uh, we just kind of dive into the tasks and to the project without really taking the time to get to know the people. So if we can build better project conversations, then we're going to have a better experience. If we're all on the same page and we work together to really understand our clients and the people we're working with, it really helps. So, one of the ways to build better project conversations is to build better working relationships and to establish a safe place for discussion so that you're working in an environment where people feel free to express their ideas there's not going to be any retribution or any disrespect and that seems like common sense doesn't it but you'd be surprised how often when people air issues or suggestions they're, they're met with judgment and ridicule and that just closes everything right down. So we want to establish trust in an environment where people are free to do what they need to do to get the job done. So I just want you to think a minute about what it means to establish some trust. First of all, the, the opposite is distrust. And that usually means that you say you're going to do something and people really aren't sure if you're actually going to do it. They don't trust that you're being honest. They don't trust that you're being transparent and open. And that is usually the number one cause for things to go off the rails. So you need an environment that has mutual respect. And it's really all about brain chemistry because there are a lot of things that can happen that happen almost subconsciously without people really recognizing it. Conversations are chemical in your body, so when things happen, chemical reactions take place in your brain that you have no control over. And you can either generate some cortisol, which is the fight or flight hormone, or you can generate some oxytocin, which is not oxycontin, it's just oxytocin, but it has a similar effect. It makes you feel happy and um, satisfied and everything is pleasant and everything's going well. Now, the, the neat thing about this is that the cortisol comes from a different part of the brain than the oxytocin. And when you're working in, with oxytocin, it's coming from the prefrontal cortex, which is also known as the executive brain. And that's where all creativity and all innovation happens. So if you've got a project that's not going well or a conversation that's not going well, you're not going to have creativity, you're not going to have innovation, you're not going to have as good a problem solving as you would if you were working from another part of the brain. So I know you guys are computer scientists, many of you. I'm not a scientist per se, but I'll share with you a little bit of the science around this and then we're going to talk about the practical reality and what you need to do to make better conversations. So the first thing you need to understand is that your reputation precedes you. How many have ever heard that term? And what do I mean by that? It means that your energy field emanates out about 10 feet from where you are. So when you walk into a room, your energy walks in first. 
And people take about seven seconds to make a judgment about you. Seven seconds. So before you even get into the room and introduce yourself to someone, people have already made judgments and decided certain things about you. They've made assumptions. And this can be a little on the dangerous side because do we have enough information to really know who you are at that point? Absolutely not. But that chemical reaction happens in the brain and they decide whether or not you're a friend or a foe. Now you've all heard about fight or flight. Fight or flight really is a basic um, hardwired thing that happens in the human brain and it was uh, you know, originally designed to help you combat stressful and threatening situations. So when there's a uh, saber-toothed tiger coming at you, um, that fight or flight kicks in and it's automatic. But there really are four aspects to this uh, hardwired issue and fight or flight and also freeze or appease. You've heard of deer in the headlights? That's kind of the freeze. And appease is the person that's always apologizing. So I invite you to think about how you are when you walk into a room and are you perceived as a friend or a foe? If you're walking in and you've you know, got a lot on your mind and there's no smile on your face and you're, you know, you're a little stressed out, things aren't going so well, people are going to read that and pick up on it whether you want them to or not. And guess what? You can't fake it. People can see through that. It's just instinctual. And if you're walking into a situation and people are arguing with you or they're contrarians or you're finding that they're challenging you on a regular basis, you are probably elicit eliciting the fight, fight response. Fight response. Because that those are clues as to how people are perceiving you. So if you're in a situation where somebody you're working with is arguing about everything you do, they're challenging everything, and it's a constant thing, you need to step back and ask yourself, okay, what are they perceiving in me that I wasn't really aware of? Same thing with flight. When people leave, they could physically get up and leave. You ever have somebody who gets up and leaves the meeting? They always have to go to the restroom or get another cup of coffee at this most inopportune time. That's the flight response. Now, you don't have to leave physically. You can leave mentally, meaning you just check out or you pick up your phone and you start doing something other than listening and paying attention. Those are all indications that you are eliciting that flight response. Now, the deer in the headlights, the freeze, people can get to the point where they're just paralyzed in their thinking. They can't really formulate any good ideas. They're just, like, stopped. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. Essentially, the meeting is kind of over. Um, this can happen quite a bit with a client when they get overwhelmed. And mostly it's because you've come across as a threat to them, either by introducing information that they don't comprehend or that they're not ready to make a decision about. But one way or the other, they're you know, looking deer in the headlights, that kind of look, and they're uh, exhibiting characteristics of the freeze. And finally, there's the appease, and that's the person that says, I'm sorry, or is constantly apologizing, like ad nauseum. Uh, way more than they need to. If you're constantly eliciting that response, that person is looking at you as a threat, not feeling like they can hold up their end of the bargain. There's fear there, and their response is that um, appease. So can you see yourself in any of those, in any of your relationships with your clients or your coworkers? Anybody? Raise a hand. Can you see yourself in some of those? Okay, so I just invite you to think about that and the, the way to combat that is to stop and to kind of think about how you came into the room, think about how you introduced your topic, how you started the meeting. Those are all things that are going to possibly elicit that response. Now, this is um, sort of a dashboard of where people are. So if you're, you've got a lot of fear and threat running through you and your cortisol is pumping out there, um, you're going to be in skeptic mode, way over on the left-hand side. Uh, you're in protect mode. You're, you're not going to be open. You're not going to be transparent. You're going to be uh, really protecting yourself. Then you move up the continuing there, and you can become a skeptic. You let your guard down a little bit, but you're still not 100% convinced. 
and it goes over to wait and see. Now you're feeling a little bit more comfortable. The environment feels a little safer. Uh, there isn't as big a threat, but you're just not really ready to completely trust what's going on. And it goes over to experimenter and eventually co-creator, where the trust is very high and you're working together as partners. And that's where you want to get. Um, so you need to do that by building good relationships. And one of the things that you can do is get your conversations focused in the right direction. There are three levels of conversations. Level one, which is talking about what you know, almost bragging, telling, yelling, selling kind of thing. Level two is a little bit manipulative. That's you've got an agenda and you're kind of trying to persuade people to come on board to your way of thinking. Where you want to be is a level three conversation where you are partners in crime, uh, no one's more knowledgeable than anyone else, you're co-creating, you're working together in an authentic and transparent way. And it's really important that you work toward those level three conversations if you're going to have good relationships and good feedback from your clients. Because in the level one conversation, there's very little listening going on. Because what happens is, if you're driving the conversation, you're like telling, selling, yelling. And the other person probably shut down. Because in all likelihood, you've invoked some cortisol. Cortisol closes us down. We stop listening, we stop participating, we just look at you and maybe shake our head, but really nothing's sinking in. So that's not very effective. Um, if you're invoking more oxytocin, now you've got an engaging conversation going on where people are fe giving feedback and really a participant. So in the second example, that's still a transaction. It's not an open discussion that fosters trust. It's a situation where you're trying to position yourself. You've got an agenda. You want people to be persuaded to do it your way. It's not a completely open and honest conversation. So you want to make sure you get to that openness. And we're going to talk about how to do that in a little bit. So again, I mentioned the tell, sell, yell. There are um, other mistakes that people make. One of them is addicted to being right. Boy, when we know something, isn't it easy for us to just think our way is the only way and we get addicted to being right? It's more important to us to be right in those situations than it is to have an effective relationship or an effective meeting with our client. And I've seen this many times where somebody will just grab onto an idea or a concept and just chew on it until everybody in the room just wants to get up and leave. Um, so you want to be careful about needing to be right. Um, you have to think of it in terms of your, your power in the room. You don't need to be right to be powerful and to be effective. You need to have a good relationship. You need to work well with others. That's really what gives you the power. But a lot of people think if, if I'm going to be mo the most knowledgeable, knowledge is power, and I'm going to be you know, clearly a cut above everyone else because I know what I'm talking about and I'm right, it's not, it really doesn't work that way. It turns people off. And, it's a very common trap that we fall into, especially when we're technical and we're people that are knowledgeable and well-educated because we, we know a lot and often we are right. We just can't act like we're addicted to being right. We need to back off a little bit and give other people a chance to have their opinion, even if you don't think it's right. And again, the reason for this, the impact um, on addicted to being right is it generates that cortisol again. And cortisol can stay in your body up to 24 hours. So you can be in a position where you've ticked somebody off or they've perceived you as a threat, and you're not going to be able to get that back on track for maybe a whole day. You waste a lot of time trying to be right or trying to tell people things rather than asking. Now, I'm a consultant, and I'm in the business of giving advice and telling people things, and I've changed my practice quite a bit because it's more important for me to establish a good relationship and find out what other people want to talk about and what they need and you know where their interests lie than it is for me to show my knowledge and tell things. 
And that's really the way everyone needs to be going forward. The world is changing, and people don't want to be told anymore. They want to contribute. They want to have the opportunity to speak their piece, and they want to have their ideas listened to. And the most precious gift you can give a client or a coworker or a spouse or anyone that you have a relationship with is the gift of listening. Most of us are terrible listeners. We're so busy thinking about what we're going to say next that we really don't hear what people are saying to us. And there's a way to listen which really leads to much better conversations, and that is drilling down and really being curious, wanting to know, not being in a situation where you're just letting the person talk, oh, are, they, are they done yet because I really have something to say. No, be curious, be interested, show that to people. That's how you build better project relationships. So level three conversations, as we already said, allow people to co-create. The brain activity that happens in those conversations comes from a different place in the brain. It invokes different hormones, different chemical responses, and it really gives people a feeling of contribution, a feeling of belonging, a feeling of happiness. It's very important. So I like this little slide um, because it talks about threats. So a threat can come from the tone of your voice. You can say almost anything to anybody if you say it with the right tone. How are you today can be a nasty comment if you don't say it with the right tone. So it's important to listen to how you sound. It's important to listen to how other people are sounding and hearing you. And also then, um, humiliation is another one. Little snide comments we might make or sarcasm sarcastic jokes that sometimes can backfire, those can cause humiliation. That's something that can be perceived as a threat. And then there's the rejection, where our ideas are flat out shut down, or, you know, oh, that's stupid, or oh, that'll never work, or comments like that just close everything right off. Cortisol starts pumping. You've lost the opportunity to work with that person in a productive and effective way for maybe 24 hours. Um, also, exclusion. So when you've got your little groups and you're talking about things and you're not including others, that can also shut people down. That can be perceived as a threat. Feeling left out is a horrible feeling. How many people have ever felt left out of something they wanted to be involved in? Everybody, it's a horrible feeling and it really closes people down. So make sure you include others. And how do you do that? By saying something like, um, Dan, how did you uh, feel about that? Have you ever experienced that? Just bring people into the conversation. Give them a chance to say something because that way they don't, aren't going to feel excluded and left out. You've all heard about clicks, right? This is really sort of like a click. Anger. If you express yourself in a way that's angry, that's going to close people down. Um, these are small, I can't read them. Territory. So, you know, again, that fiefdom feeling, that's going to shut people down. And status, feeling like you're above the rest, uh, being arrogant, feeling uh, and showing, demonstrating that you're the expert and nobody's quite as good as you. Uh, just off putting, very off putting. So, and these are um, things that it's really easy to fall into these traps, but know that they're perceived as threats by other people. And when you're trying to work with a client, you don't want to come off as being threatening. You want to come off as being helpful. You want to come off as being a partner. You want to come off as being someone who's truly interested in helping them make a difference in what they do. So, we talk about what we say. Um, there are some phrases that I know everybody uses from time to time. Uh, often we use this with our spouse, which we really need to watch that too, but things like, oh, you don't understand, or oh, that'll never work, or um, yeah, we, we already tried that, that, that isn't going to happen. You know, those are the kinds of statements that are not open up statements, they're closed down statements. And there are tons of them. So. What I challenge you to do when you're working with people is pay attention to how you feel when people use statements with you. 
What are they saying to you and how is it making you feel? Get in touch with those feelings. Do you feel mad? Do you feel like you don't want to talk to the person? Do you feel like they're uh, chastising you or uh, making fun of you or not respecting you? Because if you hear those statements come out of others, and you will, and they affect you, you'll start to learn what statements are coming out of you that affect others in a negative way. I have pages and pages of these statements, and it's really about turning those statements around and making everything sound more positive. You can question things, you can even talk about things kind of in the negative as long as you do it with a compliment first. Um, we all need to hear constructive criticism sometimes, but you want to dish that out a little bit sparingly and talk about the positive things. Always start with the positive. Give the people that you're speaking with and working with a reason to let their guard down. Don't attack them. If something's not working, okay, we'll get to that. But what is good about the situation? What can we celebrate? What's positive? Start there. And then it'll be a lot easier for people to talk about the things that maybe aren't working so well. Um, so some conversational tools that help to open people up. Um, creating a safe and trusting environment for the conversation to happen. It needs to be transparent, not clicky, truthful. I like rules of engagement. Sometimes it's helpful, especially with a new client or a new project team, to lay down some rules. How are we going to work together? Let's write those things down. Have everybody give input. And these are the rules that we review before we meet, every time we meet. It gives us an opportunity to all have a say in how the meeting should go. And those are important things in creating a safe space where we're free without judgment to express our ideas. Also, asking questions. Instead of telling and selling and yelling, ask questions. But do it with a sincere ask. An ask that is based in curiosity. An ask questions that you really don't have an answer to. Don't ask questions where you want the person to answer in a certain way. That's a level two conversation. That's an agenda. That's priming the pump for a response you want. But really let the person be free to say whatever they want. You'll no doubt learn something and it will go a long way toward improving your relationship. Listening. Like I said, listening is one of the biggest gifts you can give someone. And a true listener won't just listen, but they'll double click on the conversation. Drill down on it. What do you mean by that? Oh, really? I didn't know that. Tell me more. I'm really interested in that. And be really interested in that. That's, again, how you build that trust and that great relationship. If you have a great relationship that's based in trust with your client, you will always be able to work through any difficulties that happen because they will trust you and you will trust them. Otherwise, it'll just go off the rails every time. And finally, the last tool that you can use is what we call reframing and refocusing the conversation. So when things start to go a little bit awry, then bring it back. Just recap a little bit. Reframe it. Look at it a different way. Talk about it in different terms. Get it back on track instead of getting frustrating and starting to butt heads with the people that you're working with. So finally, this slide is a great uh, brief depiction of what goes on to generate the cortisol versus what goes on to generate the happy oxytocin. And it's all the things we've already talked about, the exclusion, the judging, limiting, not giving people a chance, dictating, telling, yelling, selling, all those things. And on the other side, when you're transparent and you're truthful, open and honest, and you really care, that's the key, you've got to really care, be curious and be interested and listen, that's when people open up and you'll get their best. And you'll be able to give them your best too. They'll be open to receiving that. Now all this can kind of be rolled up into the headline of emotional intelligence. We all have a good IQ. We're smart people. We need to work to build our EQ. And that's the ability to recognize your own emotions and the emotions of other people. And how do you do that? You can perceive emotion by looking at people's faces, by looking at their eyes, making good eye contact, 
reading their body language. Uh, you know, like I can look around the room and see who's a resistor, who's a wait and see, and who's open to this. Just by your body language. I'm not going to call anybody out. But, you know, when you've got somebody who's, um, you know, arms crossed, you know, really closed off, those are clues. Uh, tone of the voice is clue. Uh, smile, eyes, all of that. Start to pay attention and read people because the clues are right there and you can easily pick them up. On top of that, you need to be able to manage your own emotions. And that can be somewhat difficult because it's easy when we're you know, not getting anywhere and we're getting frustrated or things aren't going the way we had hoped they would. It's easy to get angry or frustrated or upset or whatever. But you've got to put controls on that because the minute you go off the rails, now everybody else closes down. So it's important to take time to learn to manage your own emotions. How do you do that? Maybe you take a breath. Take a breath. You've heard of count to 10. You know, there's a lot of ways you can do it. Uh, okay, I see it's uh, 7.30. Let's take a um, five-minute bio break. Just let everybody get up and take a breath and go do something else and then come back to the table. Whatever you need to do to cause that pause in the action so things don't keep escalating. Nip it in the bud. Take a break. And um, also, you need to develop the ability to be empathetic and compassionate. Really be able to step into the other person's shoes and understand how they might be feeling about things. For example, you're building a, we a WordPress website for one of your clients. You're very excited about all these new technologies, these plugins, all these things you're going to put in there. But they're completely overwhelmed. And you've asked them to give you a lot of content that you can put on their website because, after all, that's what makes a website, right? Some really good content. And they're completely overwhelmed. And what are you going to do when they freak out and they don't get you what you need or, you know, something awful happens and you can't do your work? You need to refocus, reframe, take a breath, get them back on track, maybe break it into smaller pieces, whatever you need to do based on what they need. It's not about you. And that's the biggest change that you can make in the way you deal with people, is to remember, it's not about you. It's all about them. And if you have that as a focus, if you're looking to help to serve them and not your own needs and your own tasks that you have to complete, that's the one thing you can do to really turn things around quickly in most any situation. And lastly, I'll just talk a little bit about the ladder of conclusions. Because we make stuff up. We all do it. We tell ourselves stories. So we have a set of beliefs. We have some you know, things that we know. We have some basis for feelings that we have. And if something goes wrong, we climb up that ladder in just like Superman, like a speeding bullet. We go right up there. We make up a bunch of stuff. We start losing sight of the facts. Oh, he doesn't like me. You know, he's never really liked me, blah, blah, blah. How do you know that? You don't know that. You make up stories. Don't. Just the way to do that is to ratchet back again and look at the facts. What are the facts? The client is overwhelmed. The client has a lot of other things going on. They can't get me what I need. It has nothing to do with me. It's about them. So be careful about rushing up that ladder of conclusions based on your own beliefs and your own feelings. Make sure that you're really keeping the client in mind and what they need. And that's that. So does anybody have any questions or comments or stories they'd like to share? Nobody? Well, yes? Is there any book that you recommend There is a book by Judith Glazer called Conversational Intelligence. And that is really where all this work comes from. Um, and it's a, it's a great book. Any other questions? Well, I hope you found this helpful and uh, wish you all the best working with your clients on your projects. Hope you have really great conversations. Thank you.